Sometimes I, as a preacher, find myself troubled, and I always know when I'm especially troubled because I don't sleep well. I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep. I've been that way for the last few days. I wake up in the morning and I check the news and I see that there is unrest. I see that there is anger. I see that our nation is, it seems, coming apart at the seams. And my question that I want to ask you this morning is this. Does God have anything to say about that? I know you probably have something to say about that. What does God say? If you haven't already opened your Bible to Isaiah, please do so. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1 before we move into our lesson. This is not a PowerPoint sermon. I'm just going to leave the text on the screen behind me because this is where our lesson is going to come from this morning. 750 years before Jesus, God looked down from heaven upon the city of Jerusalem, upon the nation of Judah. And here's what God saw. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. In Isaiah 1 verse 21, God looked down upon Jerusalem and he said, how the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it, past tense. But now, murderers. Isaiah 1 verse 22. Your silver has become dross. Your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. So God looked down from heaven upon his people, his city, Jerusalem, that he had established. And what he saw 750 years before Christ was corruption and oppression and injustice, and God resolved to do something about that. Read on, verse 24. Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Isaiah 1 verse 24, I will rid myself of my adversaries. I will take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called, future tense, the city of righteousness, the faithful city. God looked at what Jerusalem was like and he said, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to repair that. I'm going to take away your dross I'm going to purge you, O Jerusalem, my people, so that you will once again be my faithful city. It's in that context, God saying he's going to fix what's wrong in Jerusalem, that we read Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. That's where our lesson is going to come from this morning, Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. And I want you to know that Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 4 is a prophecy about the church. It is a prophecy about the church of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways in which God was going to fix what was wrong in Jerusalem 750 years before Christ was fulfilled when the church was established. If you'd like to study about the church in prophecy, and especially concerning what's happening in our society and the challenges and the injustice and the anger that people feel, if you want to study what God's word has to say about some of those things, let me list some chapters for you to read and to think about. Isaiah chapter two, more about that in just a moment. Daniel chapter two. In Daniel chapter two, God prophesies when the kingdom is going to be established. Daniel chapter 2. 
Joel chapter 2. The Old Testament prophet Joel spoke about a day when God was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. In Joel chapter 2, it's a prophecy about the establishment of the church. A, uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we read about the historical account when the church was established on the day of Pentecost. 2,000 years ago. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, Ephesians 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes that in the church that Jesus established, God has reconciled both Jew and Gentile into one body through his cross. It's a statement about the church and what's special about the church. James chapter two. James chapter two. It has a great deal to say about how we treat one another because Jesus is part of our lives, how we handle ourselves and conduct ourselves. Those chapters will give you a glorious picture of what God has done in his church. And they're all chapter twos, aren't they? Now turn in your Bible, if you haven't already done so, to Isaiah chapter two, and let's read together. I want us to analyze what God said he was going to do to fix this problem of oppression and of injustice and of corruption and of immorality. What was God going to do to fix this in Isaiah two verses one through four? And we're going to ask three questions as we analyze this. The first question is when? The second question is what? The third question is why? And then we'll draw some applications. As you read Isaiah chapter two, beginning in verse two, the first question is when? When, God, are you going to do what you're talking about in Isaiah two, verses two through four? He says in Isaiah 2, verse 2, look with me if you would. Now, it shall come to pass. I like the way the prophets preached because they didn't say it might happen. They said it's going to happen. The word of the Lord has gone forth. He has spoken and this is what will happen. Whether you like it or not, it will come to pass. We serve a God who is able to cause his will to be done. He is sovereign, he is holy, and he never lies. Titus chapter one, verse two. It shall come to pass in the latter days. There's the answer to the question when. When is this prophecy going to be fulfilled? Isaiah two, verses one through four. Did you know that there are many people who believe that this prophecy is about the end times, the end of the world. And they will say that the things we're reading here are yet to be fulfilled out there in the future somewhere. That's not what Isaiah thought, and that's certainly not what Peter and the apostles thought. In Daniel chapter two, referenced a moment ago, and verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar had seen a dream. He had seen an image and he was troubled by that. And Daniel came to speak to Nebuchadnezzar and interpret what he had seen. And in Daniel 2 verse 28, Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to tell you what will come to pass in the latter days. Daniel 2 verse 28. And then add to that Daniel 2 verse 44. Because Daniel tells you. It is in the days of the Roman kings that these prophecies, Nebuchadnezzar, will come to pass. Daniel 2.28, Daniel 2.44. The latter days to Daniel were the days of the Roman Empire, the Roman kings. But not only that, turn over in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, when the church was being established, people were wondering why they were seeing miracles and wonders. They wondered why. 
No problem at all. <laughs> they wondered why. Sometimes I want to run down the aisle myself. <laughs> Sometimes I do when y'all aren't here. So. <laughs> Look in Acts chapter 2. People were wondering what they were seeing. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 16, the Bible says... This, what you're seeing, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then Peter begins to quote Joel 2. And he says in verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, or latter days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So Peter is saying, on the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago, we're in the last days. This is what Joel was talking about. And by the way, this is what Daniel was talking about in Daniel chapter 2, because it was in the days of these kings, those Roman kings. And then we add to that what Isaiah says in Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house should be established. What were the latter days to the Old Testament prophets? They were the time when Christ and his apostles were busy bringing the kingdom to the world. Those were the last days, the latter days, in the way that the Old Testament prophets used that terminology. And so Isaiah is not talking about the end of the world here. He's talking about what happened in 33 AD on the day of Pentecost. When? Second question, what? What does God say he's going to do? He looks down on Jerusalem and he sees injustice and corruption and oppression and he sees immorality. What's God going to do about all that? What's his solution to that problem? Notice it starts with a mountain. Look at verse two again, the latter part. In the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Now just get the image in your head. He's saying that there's a hill where the Lord's house is located and literally that was the case. The temple, the city of Jerusalem was built on top of a hill. They named that hill, they named that location Zion. And so when people talk about Zion and, and what Zion represents, that's the place where God's house is located. That's where the city of David is located. That's where Jerusalem is located. And it's literally, even today, it's on a hill. And God is saying, metaphorically, that mountain, even though it's not all that tall, even though it's not all that noteworthy right now, it is going to become the most important mountain that this world has ever known. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established on top of the mountains. It's higher than the highest. It shall be exalted above the hills. It's more important than any other hill that this world ever know, knew. It's important. And notice at the end of verse two, what's God going to do? He says, all nations shall flow to it. Every tribe and every tongue and every ethnicity and every language, all of them will flow to this mountain of the Lord's house. When's that gonna happen? It's gonna happen in the latter days. It's gonna happen when the church is established. So God is saying, I'm going to fix this corruption and immorality and injustice, and I'm going to do it by establishing the mountain of the Lord's house and exalting it above the hills. All nations will flow to it. Incidentally, at the end of verse two, that word flow, the Hebrew word for river is a noun. And there are four places in the Old Testament where the word flow, where the word river is a verb. This is one of those four. And what he's saying is all the peoples of the world are going to be in one river flowing towards the house of the Lord in the last days, the latter days. Okay, why? Why is that your solution to the problem, God? Why is that what you want to do in this world? He tells you in verse three. 
there is an invitation. Look at how verse three begins. Many people shall come, come where? To the house of the Lord on the mountain. They shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. There's an invitation. We are welcome there. All nations, Jew and Gentile alike, we are welcome at the house of the Lord. We are welcome on the mountain together. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. It's an invitation. Brethren, this, the, the, when we think about what Jesus did, he offered an invitation not just to the Jews, but he offered it to the Gentiles. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, we sometimes miss this. Go and make disciples of all the nations, he said. Jew and Gentile alike. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter what language they speak. Go and turn them into my disciples. It's an invitation. Come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Why? There's an invitation. What are we going to do when we get to the house of the Lord? Look at verse 3. He will teach us his ways. Don't overlook that. We are coming to the house of the Lord so that he can speak to us, so that he can tell us what we need to do and how we need to behave, so that he can tell us what our values need to be. We're coming to the house of the Lord so that he can teach us his ways. A lot of people come to God and they want to tell God how things ought to be. And they want to tell God how they're going to live their lives and what their stipulations and standards are. They want to tell God about what they think is the answer to the problems that plague the world. We're coming to the house of the Lord so that he may teach us his ways. And when we learn his ways, don't miss this point. When we learn his ways, we will be just people. We will be fair people. We will be compassionate people. When we learn his ways, we will be humble people because that's what the ways of God teach us to be. They show us Christ and they show us what it means to follow Christ. He's teaching us his ways. And not only does he teach us his ways, but look at the next line. We shall walk in his paths. The reason why we learn the ways of God and let him teach us is so that it can change the way we think and it can change the way we live. We are going to walk in his paths. There's instruction, there's application. The purpose of knowledge is to live, be doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1 verse 22. He's going to teach us his ways. We're going to walk in his paths. And then look at the end of verse three. For out of Zion, that's the hill where Jerusalem was located. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, wait a minute, just, just a minute. I've read the Old Testament. The law did not go forth from Zion. I read the book of Exodus and it told me that in Exodus chapter 19, when the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, that they spent about a year at Mount Sinai and Moses went up on that mountain and God wrote on tablets of stone his commandments for his people. You remember reading that? That's where the law came from. So what does Isaiah mean? When he says in verse three, for out of Zion, different mountain, out of Zion shall go forth the law. He's talking about what happened in Acts chapter two. Because it was in the temple on the day of Pentecost when the apostles went into the temple and preached the gospel for the first time and they baptized 3,000 people. That all happened in the temple and that was not an accident. That was not a coincidence. That was fulfillment of prophecy. Where did the church begin of which you are a member? Some people say, well, the church I'm a part of began in Rome. The church I'm a part of began as a schism in Scotland, in England, 
in Germany. The church of which I am a part began in the Midwest of America. Brethren, the law was going to go forth out of Zion. The word of the Lord was gonna go forth from Jerusalem. God's solution to the problem of corruption and of immorality and of godlessness was to send forth a new law from Zion. And we desire to be a part of the church that Isaiah is talking about. It's all we want. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Let's go back to the gospel that was preached in Jerusalem and let's learn from God and let's walk in his paths. That's what Isaiah said was going to happen. And then look at this in verse four. There's an invitation, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's learn from his ways. And when that happens, verse four says this, he, God, shall judge between the nations. He will rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What's being said in verse four? God, when he teaches us his ways, is gonna teach us how to live. And when people start to live the way God teaches, verse four is the result of that. I hear people talking a lot about verse four and they say, you know, I haven't seen a time in world history when nation, uh, nations put down their swords and they all lived in unity and harmony. So that must still be in the future. That must still be somewhere out there. It's not yet realized. I don't believe that's true. You know what Isaiah is describing in verse four? He's describing what it's like to be a New Testament Christian. That's what he's doing. He's describing what it's like to be a New Testament Christian. Well, how do you know that, John? Because of what I see happening in the New Testament. The early church struggled with ethnicity. Are you a Jew or a Gentile? You're a Gentile? Well, have you been circumcised like the Jews? You have to be if you're going to be a Christian. The early church struggled with dietary customs. Really? You're going to eat that? My people would never have eaten those things. The early church struggled with racial prejudice. I'm not going to that land to talk to those people. I've always been taught that they were unclean. Acts chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. What God has cleansed, do not call common. And so, what Isaiah says is that when we come to Christ, when we become a part of this group of people who come to learn from the Lord and live according to his ways, this is the result. He teaches us, he trains us, to turn our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. When I was a kid, I wondered what a plowshare was. That wasn't a term I was familiar with. I was a little bit less puzzled by the pruning hooks. You know what those are though? A plowshare is the part of a plow that digs a furrow in the ground. So when a farmer gets out behind a horse or a mule and he's, he's digging a row, a furrow in the ground, the plowshare is the part, the implement, the tool that digs a ridge, a furrow, a, 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 um, a place for the, for the farmer to plant the crops in the ground. A pruning hook. Pruning hook is like a saw on the end of a pole. And you could reach up to the high places on the fruit trees and you could clip the fruit so that it would fall to the ground and you could harvest the fruit. And what Isaiah is saying is God's solution when we come to him and learn his ways is that we will learn to take our swords that we fight about, the things that we, that we find as being divisive, we turn those things into plowshares, implements for work. We turn our spears into pruning hooks. That's what people do when they become New Testament Christians. 
Isaiah later in his book would say this in Isaiah 9 verse 6 speaking about Jesus Christ he said he himself is our peace he is the prince of peace the prince of peace and in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 Paul says he is our peace what Jesus has done through the cross is he has taken every tribe and tongue and nation and he has reconciled us all to himself and all to God and all to one another by the cross. He's the Prince of Peace. And so the New Testament says things like this. Because of the gospel, there is now no more Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, verse 28. You know what the church is? The church is the most special, the most unique group of people on planet earth. I'm talking about the church that started in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the one that started by people listening to what God was saying and doing what he said. That church is special. And the reason why it's special is because it doesn't matter where you came from. And it doesn't matter what language you speak. And it doesn't matter what your skin color is. None of that matters because you can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we become family. We become one. And the problems that our nation faces are the same kinds of problems. And I'm not making light of those. They are the same kinds of problems that have historically plagued the world. They have always been the problem. And the way that that problem is solved is not by us, human beings, trying to reason this out and figure it out. The way the problem gets solved is by, by people who are faithful to God saying, listen to me, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. Let's learn from his ways. Let him teach us and let's walk according to his principles. There is unity and there is hope to be found in that approach. That's what God is saying. And if you argue with that, you've got an argument with God. It's not John making this up. God said, I'm going to fix the injustice and the oppression and the taking advantage of people. I'm going to fix that, God said, and I'm going to fix it by letting all nations come to me so that they can learn from me. And I'm going to bring them all together in one body. And so I say to you this morning, the New Testament church has the only message that will work to solve the problems that our society faces. There is injustice and oppression in our society. We are blind if we deny that. There is unfairness and there is corruption in our society. We are naive if we say that's not true. But what is the solution? I'll tell you this, the solution as I read my Bible is in Christ and his gospel. That's where the solution can be found. Listen to what I'm about to say. We will not have hope if we embrace our identities and our distinctiveness and say that's what makes us all special. The way we're gonna find hope is by losing our identity in Christ. That's exactly what the apostle Paul did. Read Philippians 3, read Galatians 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's what I want to be seen. I want Jesus to be seen in me. And I'm going to treat people with compassion. I'm going to treat them with dignity. I'm going to treat them with kindness. And I'm going to stand up against unkindness and unchristlikeness. And I'm going to say this, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let him teach us his ways because you'll find hope and you'll find a solution to the challenges that face you as well. But I wanna say this, what I'm suggesting, what God's solution to this problem was, it does not work if we only take part of God's word. It does not work if we selectively decide that we like a few verses that deal with justice and a few verses that deal with inequality and a few verses that deal with unfairness. And I'm gonna take those and I'm gonna preach those, but I'm not gonna give my life completely to Jesus Christ. It will not work, cannot work. The only way that what Isaiah is talking about works 
is if we humble ourselves and we submit to the gospel and we become New Testament Christians. In the church, people can find brotherhood, family. That's the way God designed it. Regardless of where we come from, regardless of our background, we are brethren in Christ. There's hope in Christ and his gospel. God has made a way for people to be one. It's the path of humility. It's the path of submission to God's will. It's the path of the God of Jacob. So my invitation to you this morning is this. Won't you come and go up to the house of the Lord? Won't you sit down and let him teach you his ways? And won't you walk in his paths? That's what the church says and has been saying for 2,000 years. God provided a solution to the problems that plagued Jerusalem 750 years before Christ. And it is the same solution that will work today if we'll humble ourselves and put Christ first. If you need to be baptized, that's how you become a Christian. That's how you participate in what the Bible calls the new birth. John chapter three, verse five. There's no better decision you could make this morning than that. If you need to respond to the gospel this morning, if we can help you, 